of tens of thousands of Indians living east of the Mississippi to allegedly vacant lands west of the river, a horrific process carrying the epithet, the Trail of Tears. In the decade preceding the Civil War, federal officials negotiated treaties with tribes residing on the Central Plains and in the lands newly acquired in the Southwest to clear the way for white settlers. In general, these treaties provided for the establishment of permanent reservations with clearly defined boundaries and with the provision of agricultural implements and supplies to encourage the Indians' adoption of farming. Lincoln's Indian policies were largely in keeping with these earlier precedents. Like <coughs> Jefferson, Lincoln believed that the key to Indian self-sufficiency and upward mobility lay in tilling the soil, and that tribes must embrace a sedentary agricultural economy to survive. At a meeting with Plains Indian dignitaries in March 1863, this kind of fuzzy poor image is apparently the only image in existence of Lincoln with Indians. And this is a picture of that meeting. But at this meeting in March 1863, Lincoln instructed his aides to bring in a giant globe and had a professor from the Smithsonian give them a lecture on geography. White men controlled large portions of the globe and vastly outnumbered their red brethren, Lincoln argued because they cultivated the earth and depended upon its products rather than wild game for their subsistence. I can see no way in which your race is to become as numerous and prosperous as the white race, the president added, except by living as they do, by cultivation of the earth. The Lincoln administration was likewise, likewise an early proponent of allotment, the policy whereby government officials oversaw the division of reservation lands among Indian residents who would henceforth be individual property holders. In the words of Commissioner Dole, better, a better able to engage in the rational pursuits of civilization. When fully enacted in 1887, the Dawes Act proved disastrous for Indian communities and was, was responsible for tribal losses of an estimated 60% of all of their lands before the Dawes Act was abolished in 1934 under FDR. President Lincoln likewise adopted a practice that he fully understood was potentially harmful to the well-being of his Indian wards, that is the patronage system. Awarding Indian Bureau jobs to loyal partisans may have been politically convenient, but their ignorance of Indian cultures and traditions often exacerbated deplorable reservation conditions. Upon taking office, Lincoln quickly discovered that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was a bountiful source of patronage, and he spent considerable time parceling out the spoils. In March 1861, he sent instructions to Secretary of the Interior Caleb Smith requesting that he make out blank appointments for all Indian Bureau positions and send them to the Republican congressional delegations in Wisconsin and in Minnesota. The folly of Lincoln's political opportunism, as we will see, would become apparent a year and a half later in Minnesota. In his second and third annual messages to Congress, Lincoln discussed the need to remodel the nation's entire Indian system. Commissioner Dole provided the specifics. First, he endorsed the confinement of Indians on reservations and the allotment of their lands, <coughs> policy that he believed were the best method yet devised for their advancement in civilization. Second, Dole proposed a policy that when, that when enacted a century later, in the 1940s and 50s, carried the dreaded appellation termination. In short, termination called for the cessation of government responsibilities to Native Americans, and that they henceforth be treated as citizens of the states in which they resided. Dole believed 
that tribal communities were ready for this, for what, when the peculiar relations existing between Indians and the federal government may cease, and their relations to the general government should be identical with those of the citizens of the various states. In the meantime, concentration on reservations continued, but with a new twist. White settlements surrounded many existing reservations, and Indians dole charge. Back up one sec. In the meantime, concentration on reservations continued, but with a new twist. White settlements surrounded many reservations. And instead of providing Native Americans with an example of moral and advanced civilization, whiskey peddlers, gamblers, and the worst classes of white people were leading them into a life of idleness, beggary, and vice. Consequently, Indians were, according to Dole, becoming vagrants of the worst species and a most intolerable nuisance to the settlements. The solution to this problem was obvious, at least according to the commissioner. In his October annual report, he declared that the most efficient remedy for these evils was concentrating the various tribes on reservations set far apart from white settlement. Doing so, he insisted, would be economical, simple in operation, and of inestimable value to the Indians. A word is in order here regarding President Lincoln's similar advocacy of colonization for African Americans. Convinced that the races could not coexist peacefully, <coughs> Lincoln was a longtime promoter, proponent of colonizing African Americans in Africa, the Caribbean, or in Latin America. According to historian Kenneth O'Reilly, Lincoln hoped that colonization might spare future generations racial agony and, quote, promote racial harmony by removing the source of irritation. Since Indians were Native Americans and therefore not amendable to deportation, their colonization on remote reservations in the nation's interior, in Lincoln's mind, could serve the same end. Although scholars continue to debate whether Lincoln genuinely believed that colonization was a workable or practical solution to the nation's troubled history of race relations, the apparent consistency between his administration's advocacy of geographically segregating African Americans and Native Americans from white society suggests that he was, in fact, a true believer. This picture here is of James Mitchell. He was Lincoln's agent for colonization of African Americans, and then Commissioner Dole, who would be the agent for Indian colonization. Um, I'm working on seeing if these two guys communicated with each other. I'm trying. I'm trying to find and access Dole's papers to see if there's any uh, sharing of ideas about their. Uh, their ultimate goals. The inconsistency of federal Indian policy and its uneven application date back, date back to George Washington. The treaty system, education, removal, either voluntary or mandatory, and the reservation system were all heralded as new solutions or new directions that promised to correct the dysfunctional relationship that had existed between Indians and non-Indians for generations. Abe Lincoln's Indian policy was no different in this regard. On the one hand, Lincoln sought the assimilation of the Native Americans and an end to the special relationship that existed between tribes and the federal government. On the other hand, Lincoln viewed treaty making as the best way to ensure that the federal government would acknowledge and protect Indian land, lands and rights. Apparently un unaware of the contradiction, the, the Lincoln administration pursued treaty making, which by definition acknowledged the sovereignty of Indian nations and assimilation simultaneously. 
In fact, Lincoln sought to expand the treaty system while at the same time predicting Indians would at some point come under state jurisdiction and that their rights become identical with those of the citizens of the various states. Another Lincoln-era Indian policy initiative linked treaty making with Indian removal in hopes of saving even the remnant of these most de uh, of these decaying tribes, one senator declared in May 1862, we must gather them somewhere on large reservations. The somewhere he had in mind was the Indian Territory, or Oklahoma. At the start of the Civil War, Confederate agents successfully recruited or cajoled members of the so-called five civilized tribes to form auxiliary units to fight for the Confederacy. Their perceived disloyalty provided policymakers an opening. In March of 1863, Congress authorized the president to rescind treaties with any tribes in an actual state of hostility to the government of the United States. With the treaty obligations out of the way, the federal government could expropriate their lands and then open new reservations for tribes residing east of the Rocky Mountains. In the summer of 1863, Lincoln dispatched William Dole to Kansas to negotiate several of these new treaties with tribes to remove them to Indian territory to inhabit lands that had just been uh, taken from the five civilized tribes. The tribes appeared interested, Dole reported, and awaited the end of the Civil War and restoration of peace before proceeding. The final and most studied episode of Lincoln's tenure as a great white father was his role in the Dakota War of 1862, a tragic affair that forever marred his legacy among Native Americans. The president, one, one must recall, was under considerable pressure during the summer of 1862. The Peninsular Campaign had failed to capture Richmond. General John Pope, commander of the Union, Union's Army of Virginia, had just been defeated at Second Bull Run. In the midst of all of this, word arrived in Washington that the, that, that the Dakota, or Santee Sioux, were attacking settlements and massacring men, women, and children in southern Minnesota. Was this some part of deep laid, of some deep laid plan, a Confederate conspiracy to expand the battlefield and force Lincoln to divert troops from the east? Was it the opening salvo in a long dreaded pan-Indian alliance seeking to take advantage of the government's preoccupation with the Civil War? Well, as it turned out, the origins lay not with either of those, but with hunger and frustration. When the government failed to make its promised annuity payments to the Dakotas, the Indians faced the prospect of starvation. White traders who made a fortune selling supplies to the Indians refused to extend credit, one infamous, infamously declaring that if the Indians were hungry, they should eat grass. Dakota agent Thomas J. Galbraith, pictured here on your left, a Republican politician who owed his appointment to Lincoln's use of the patronage system, exacerbated matters by refusing to, to distribute rations he had locked away in a warehouse. Although he was later exonerated by two different congressional investigations, into allegations that he started the whole Dakota uprising. His refusal to issue rations and subsequent activities leading militia against the Indians cast doubt on his fidelity to the people he was supposed to be serving. And I think illuminate the consequences of Lincoln's negligent use of patronage in this regard. The Dakota War lasted two months and in early October, General John Pope, uh, who, who Lincoln had reassigned following his defeat at Second Bull Run, he sends him out to Minnesota to deal with the Santees. Well, in October of 1862, Pope declared that the, the Dakota War was over. Casualty estimates varied, but the number of white deaths fell somewhere between 500 and 1,000 
Indian deaths, maybe about 150 or so. In late September, Pope had given his approval to the creation of a tribunal or commission comprised of five military officers to try Dakotas involved in the massacre of civilians. The commission began hearings on, on September 28th, tried 16 men the same day. Five weeks later, the commission completed its work, having conducted 392 trials, including an astounding 40 in one day. Dakota defendants had no counsel. One eyewitness later reported the commission apparently trusting that the innocent would make their innocence appear. Few Dakotas, as it turned out, were able to, to accomplish, accomplish to speak to the, to the commission's satisfaction. And on November 7th, Pope telegrammed the names of 303 condemned Dakotas to President Lincoln. The great white father was under heavy pressure to authorize all 303 executions. The white citizens of Minnesota were clamoring for revenge, and the state's leaders threatened mob violence if justice were not meted out on the Dakotas. As Lincoln and his aides reviewed the trial transcripts, they were shocked at the appalling lack of evidence and the haste in which the trials were carried out. What the people of Minnesota desired, Lincoln understood, was blood vengeance, not justice. But there were other considerations he had to, to bear in mind. How would Europe respond, England and France in particular, to the execution of more than 300 Indian prisoners? Might those executions spur the creation of the much dreaded Pan-Indian Alliance? Or maybe open the door to Confederate intrigue? On December the 1st, Lincoln wrote Judge Advocate, Advocate General jo Joseph Holt seeking an opinion on what should be done with the condemned Sioux, asking whether, whether if I should conclude to execute only a part of them, must I designate which ones, or, I, or could I leave that designation to some officer on the ground? Holt answer, Holt's answer was that Lincoln would have to decide the matter on his own. After reviewing the evidence, Lincoln divided the individual cases into two groups, those that had participated in massacres and those that had participated in battles. And it was on this basis, on December the 6th, the president ordered that 39 of the 303 Dakotas, only those who had participated in massacres, be executed. Of these 39, one was pardoned, but at 10.30 a.m., on December the 26th, day after Christmas, 1862, 38 Sioux were hanged simultaneously on a large square-shaped scaffold erected on the main street in Mankato. Afterwards, their bodies were cut down and buried in a 30 by 12 grave dug in a sandbar near town. One newspaper account said that there were some entrepreneurs there chopping up pieces of the rope and then s and selling the rope used in the nooses as souvenirs. At least one Sioux who Lincoln had not approved for execution was hanged ne nevertheless, apparently being included by mistake. While the president served the cause of justice by greatly decreasing the number of Indians he permitted to hang, he still sanctioned his David A. Nichols and other historians have noted one of the largest mass executions in American history. For the Santee Sioux, Lincoln's humanitarianism was little more than a macabre joke, and to this day, the Santee people commemorate the lives of the 38 men executed on the orders of the Great White Father. While rightly acclaimed, for his steadfast leadership during the Civil War, Abe Lincoln's Indian policy was about what one would expect from an individual who knew little about Native Americans, did not consider Indian affairs a high priority, and whose attention was constantly directed elsewhere. In many respects, the great emancipator's Indian policy was in keeping with historic precedent and tradition. He was an assimilationist, who believed that Indians must abandon their traditional activities and that agricultural held, agriculture held the key to their progress and self-sufficiency. 
convinced that Indians, like African Americans, could not peacefully coexist in a white-dominated society. He became a strong advocate of concentrating or colonizing tribes on reservations. Lincoln's early endorsement of allotment, a policy that later wreaked irrevocable havoc among Indian communities, is certainly not a legacy to crow about, nor was his use of Indian service positions to reward political supporters. His desire to expand the treaty system may very well have been motivated by humanitarian impulses, but the government had shown time and again that Indian treaties, while convenient, were most certainly not to be treated as the supreme law of the land. Just six years after his assassination, Congress passed legislation ending the treaty system altogether. In an article published 40 years ago, historian Harry Kelsey argued that Lincoln's most lasting accomplishment in Indian affairs was insisting that the federal government accept a moral premise for its relations with the Indian tribes. President Lincoln no doubt believed that the government had an obligation to do this, but life's vicissitudes have a way of altering one's priorities. For Lincoln, the tragic events in Minnesota during the summer of 1862 proved how difficult it was and still is to live up to such high ideals. Finally, one last thing. A, a recent poll that we've talked about of political scientists asking them to rank the presidents in order from best to worst placed Abraham Lincoln, big surprise, at, in the top spot. Other luminaries in the top ten included George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, Harry Truman, and Thomas Jefferson. From a Native American perspective, all seven of these great white fathers were disasters. Some were treaty breakers, all were assimilationists, others were expansionists and Indian removal enthusiasts, and three were proponents of terminating the government's obligations to tribes. President Lincoln was all of the above. Obviously, being a poor great white father does not unduly tarnish a president's legacy. To be fair, Abraham Lincoln was operating within a horrifically challenging historical context, and it may be disingenuous to cast stones at the man who saved the Union. On the other hand, the nation's Native American population cannot be blamed for viewing Lincoln through a very different lens. For them, the preservation of the Union meant a more rapid dissolution of their homelands as Northerners and Southerners shifted their attention to the West. Abraham Lincoln, in conclusion, was an atypical president whose views and policies in regards to American Indians were disappointingly typical of the broader society in which he lived. Face it, a lot of Native groups, uh, you know, they saw U.S. government. They're the ones that removed us. They're the ones that have broken treaties. They're the enemy. Not that Lincoln himself was was any worse than, than others, but the Confederates were in a, a strong position to recruit Indian support, and uh, they were successful doing so. You also have to remember that a lot of those tribes were slaveholding tribes, and so that'd be another reason why they would have been interested in aligned with the Confederacy. So um, he was successful in uh, Pike, the Confederate agent, was successful in recruiting several uh, different 
regiments or brigades of Indian troops. What's going to happen, though, is that they're not going to get paid. They're not going to get any supplies. They're not going to have uh, any of the same kind of priority attention that troops back east would receive. And so um, Pike and a lot of the Indian units are going to basically melt away. And, uh, and they're not going to be you know, actively engaged throughout the entire war. But, but early on, they, Jefferson Davis and the Confederate government believed that that would be uh, um, a, a great idea. And you know, once again, critics of Lincoln would say, you didn't pay enough attention to the Indian Terry. You should have had agents down there you know, in the summer of 1861, encouraging those tribes to remain faithful to the, to the federal government and that they had treaty obligations to uh, you know, that they had to live up to. And ultimately those that that went with the South are going to, you know, they're, they're in violation of treaties and they lose their lands and they're going to be um, replaced by tribes from the Central Plains. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I didn't know anything about the Dakota thing, uh, so I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything, because Lincoln fought in the Black Hawk War and it Is there yeah. any animosity there? Is there any okay. anything going on? With he, well, he, he quote, fought in the Black Hawk War, but he, he served. Uh, he, I don't believe he fired a shot. They say that he yeah, injured he himself. Mosquitoes. Okay, the, the <laughs> mosquitoes. That was the worst uh, the thing that happened to him. There is an anecdote about how during the Black Hawk War, he and his men were sitting around a campfire, and an elderly Indian walked up to the campfire, and the men were, his soldiers were ready to tear this Indian man to pieces. And according to the legend, you know, Lincoln jumps in between them and says, no, we're, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, we're not going to have that and save the man's life. I mean, that, that's all based on, uh, you know, secondary sources. I don't know the, of anyone that I witnessed that, that, that wrote about it. The other thing that, that, uh, that, that could be considered as an influence was that Lincoln's grandfather, Abraham, was killed by Indians back in Kentucky, uh, leaving Lincoln's father, uh, you know, I don't know about destitute, but leaving him impoverished. And so there was all, you know, there was certainly family tradition about, yeah, you know, my grandpa Abraham got killed by Indians, and uncle, I think it was Mordecai, Mordecai Lincoln shot and killed that Indian, and he's kind of a hero. So. That was something that Lincoln certainly knew about, and that may have played a role. But I'm still convinced that the overall attitude is basically kind of indifference. That I've got I've got bigger fish to fry here, right? With the Civil War and saving the Union. But the tie between the Sioux of the Black Hawk War with the Sioux of the Rebellion. That's that's 30 years. Black Hawk Wars sure, back sure. in the late 18. Sure. Well, so 20, 20, right. 20 or 24 years. Yeah. So I don't think he he had any grudges from okay. the Black Hawk War that he played a played a part in this. What do you think about the uh, the connection between colonization of blacks and reservations? Is that is that reasonable or no? Just an observation. When you when you had your slides that showed the arrow that started with uh, assimilation, yes. it seems to me that's the inverse of what the approach with the African Americans is, because they were separated out. <laughs> they wanted to remove them, and now the assimilation yeah. seems to me to be the opposite. Of yeah, the that's really interesting. That's good. <laughs> that, that's a, a, a very good insight. I thought about that, but that's something that could be. I've got to expand this by about 10 pages in order for well, it to Well, I'm it. ignorant of the subject. That would just do No, no, but that's good. That's that. That's really interesting. Uh, My only problem with, your, with the way you, you, you're doing that is that, is that you're also saying Lincoln did assimilation, and therefore 
assimilation of Indians, but definitely not assimilation of African Americans. Right. So there is that contradiction there. I don't know if you can play that up in a certain way. Yeah, if we're trying to explain that. You know, why was assimilation for Indians desired, but assimilation of African Americans viewed as, you know, as, as not workable? Yes, sir. About uh, 45 years ago, Norman Gravener wrote uh, an essay uh, in David Donald's Why the North Won the Civil War, uh, emphasizing uh, Lincoln's reluctance to emancipate and, and how frustrated the Garrisonian abolitionists were with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would think that if you're going to make some sort of time flax, that that could at least rate maybe a paragraph or, or a big footnote, because uh, it, it did seem, uh, well, Lip Wendell Phillips, mm -hmm. the, the great orator of the abolitionists, uh, many times raised the cry, how many times will we save Kentucky and lose the war? And in other words, that, that Lincoln's concern for uh, liberating uh, slaves was uh, very distant to keeping the the border states, border slave states right. in the Union, and also trying to uh, avoid uh, uh, outside help from Britain or France to the, the Confederacy. So I, I think you've got a, a, a topic that, that can have a great deal of contextualization, uh, right. again, to show that, that you're not just simply picking on Lincoln, that there, right. there's a whole lot there that uh, doesn't put Lincoln in the, the finest of lights. Sure. It's also relevant in that regard is uh, no less an authority than Frederick Douglass who eulogized Lincoln and said he was not our man from our point of view, he was slow and tardy and so forth. However, he said he was the democratic leader of a country and had he begun to go too far beyond the wishes of the people, he could have accomplished nothing. And his conclusion was that essentially he had done uh, what he had to do uh, with regards to black. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Um, I remember uh, back in the one of these conferences oh, okay. one of years ago that saw the after effects of there was a sudden spike in the late 80s of, of new interest in Lincoln uh, documentaries, movies on TV. I think Gore Vidal's book had just come out. And um, people were shocked. <laughs> right, because they were just shocked to know that Lincoln didn't believe in integration. And, and of course, I thought, why, why are people always shocked about history? You know, um, <laughs> um, if you consider it in context, Lincoln was no less enlightened about race than any other educated white male of his day. And I think we usually have to take that in the context which is because we can't expect him to have a 20th century viewpoint Absolutely. Of, of racial integration to begin with. Right. No, I, I, I agree. And in terms of his Indian policy, he was, you know, he was certainly um, typical of the people of that, of that day. But we have higher expectations of him. You know, he's Lincoln for God's right. sakes. He should be, you know, do something more. So, so to find out that, you know, he wasn't, uh, I mean, I think any other president in his place, probably, you know, if William Seward had been elected, he probably would have done, exactly. it, it, you know, pursued the same kinds of policies. Yeah. But with Lincoln, you know, because with uh, the gentleman yesterday, you know, we should just make him a national god so that others have a chance <laughs> at, at, the, at the top spot of the polls. We, we view him as a national god and we say, well, no, and Dr. Peterson, you know, he was a human and he, in all aspects of his presidency, he was now number one, right? And so in this regard, with his Native American policy, there was all sorts of terrible inconsistencies. But it's been that way going all the way back to you know, our founding. Uh, yeah, one, yes, sir. Well, what interests me, following up what you said, John, is for Lincoln, the Declaration of Independence was central to his political policy. And it's sort of interesting how limited, really, going back to Jefferson, the Declaration really was in terms of how we view it today as sort of a, a standard bearer for expanding rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
I have to say that I'm disappointed because the missiles I brought to throw and the rope I brought, <laughs> I have to put away because that was like, a, that like your paper on Peter Roosevelt, that I find was very judicious. Yeah. And, you know, okay. It's my well, I appreciate it. It's not, I mean, if I dug deep, I could probably find some, well, you did get some, uh, a, 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 a silver cane to the Pueblos and it did approve some, <laughs> some uh, you know, uh, a limited land grant for them. Oh, well. So he did some good things, but overall, uh, his, his Indian policy is just not anything to write home about. Uh, Sir? A, a couple of things, I, I, I think we can't underrate uh, the idea of when those in Minnesota were really after wiping out the tribe, and especially those 300 who killed uh, their, what did they do, 500 whites or something? Right. Uh, Lincoln was in a, it was a big political move for him to only execute for uh, 39. It was a, it, that was not a popular move on his part. They, they wanted them all killed. Yeah. Although and he still took Minnesota in the 64 election. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's good. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but the other thing is, what happened to the, the, the other 170 Indians that were condemned yeah. but, but, but not sentenced, they apparently sat in like horrific concentration camp condition prisons and he apparently didn't do any didn't lift a finger to, to help them. I, I, I don't mean to be an apologist or any no, apology. No. Uh, but I'm just saying that, that that's on uh, the, the other thing is I think what he was showing was tremendous frustration with what to do and I think this is a connection between the blacks and the Indians. What to do with the non traditional uh, invaders of the uh, of this continent. That is the whites. <coughs> I mean, how do you how do you integrate these people in? He didn't think you could. That's why he talked about the colonization and so on, which is unacceptable. And uh, I think the concentration of Indians in, in uh, uh, was was also unacceptable. But he had no idea how you're going to integrate them. And they obviously had a lot of foresight in knowing it was going to be a big ass problem for a long time. Yeah. And it is. And we haven't solved it yet. Right. I can tell you after traveling through the Indian country in 1960 and traveling through it today, it's an incredible improvement in the way they're living. There's no comparison. I mean, there's just no comparison. But it isn't good. So we haven't solved that problem. We haven't solved the problem of integrations of blacks into the total community. We have not solved that problem. So he was right. It's going to be a long time. And even beyond that, I would argue that our reaction today, or the reaction of a large segment of the population today, isn't entirely dissimilar with regard to Guantanamo. Anyway, you've yeah. got a lot there. Thanks, Thanks thank you very much, Dr. Gritton. Uh, <laughs> as to the comment, I don't necessarily agree, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, it's a good illustration of where you can look at the same thing and two people can see a different picture, even though the full cell is trying to be fair minded. Uh, and, and even though one is right and one is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've got five minutes to do the ten, and I'm going to do it in five minutes because I only have two pages to do today rather than five pages. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, I'm filling in for Dr. Vella and, uh, and her new book, which is going to be out which is within a matter of a day or two, probably, uh, on the biography of George Washington Carver. And this is something that's brand new, and it, it has interpretations, too, and it'll be debated uh, in terms of 
George Washington Carver's view of Lincoln. Um, and um, most of you heard this the other time, so I don't want to go over all that. George Washington Carver, born in 1860, died in 1943. Um, and um, he was born a slave, and uh, he was adopted by his white parents who were illiterate, uh, raised him. And so what's the connection between George Washington Carver and Abraham Lincoln? He had always heard stories about Lincoln which were not found in print. So maybe they came from a different planet, or maybe they were talking to Dr. Britton or his ancestors, uh, or I don't know what, but it's just that these were stories that were either invented or they came from some place. Um, he could describe Lincoln's childhood home in Pigeon Creek, uh, Indiana, after they moved up from uh, Kentucky, uh, with details, and somehow or another he got that information. Now remember, uh, George Washington Carver was born in Missouri, so how does he know all this stuff about Lincoln that's not in print, uh, and he knows it in detail? Uh, and the third uh, thing that Dr. Bellow points out is that he can repeat conversations between uh, young Abraham Lincoln and his father. Now, you heard how Dr. Britton described the, uh, the killing of Tom Lincoln's father, Lincoln's grandfather. I would describe that as being scalped. And if you had a family member that was scalped, uh, that had a big impact in Tom, Tom Lincoln observed his grand grandfather being scalped. You don't forget things like that. Um, just, just, and I'm not criticizing uh, Dr. Britton. <laughs> uh, if that happens in, uh, to you personally, you never forget that. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, how did he know all this stuff about Lincoln? And he ends up with a positive view of Lincoln, and which may be legit or may not be legit. Okay, so he learns this, according to Dr. Vella, and she has correspondence from Carver uh, in which he talked about Lincoln and how he learned about uh, Lincoln, the Lincoln story. It came from his adopted father, and his adopter, adopted father uh, was Moses uh, Carver, sometimes called Mose. And her point is, which I've never read any place else, and I believe this is new, and Dr. Bella uh, deserves credit for this, Moses Carver lived next door to Abraham Lincoln in Pigeon Creek. Have you heard that before? I've never heard that before. Um, and Mo Moses Carver um, is the person who originally owned uh, um, George Washington Carver uh, as a slave. Um, and so Moses, or Mose, and his wife Susan, both illiterate, purchased uh, George Washington Carver's mother when she was 13 years old uh, to give her a home. So these were two illiterate white people living, well, that have a humanitarian streak in them. George and his mother were kidnapped by a gang um, during the Civil War. Um, and Moses uh, sent a neighbor to the people that gang that that uh, that uh, kidnapped her and the kids uh, with a ransom. During this process, uh, Moses is uh, George Washington Carver's mother disappears from history. We don't know what happened to her, but she, she just disappears. Uh, but the infant George was cared for and raised by the Carver uh, like a son. And something like, both as a, as a son and something like a freed slave, as was his older brother Jim. So if, I'm, if you're following this, uh, George Washington Carver had an had a older brother, uh, and the, the uh, uh, Moses and uh, Susan adopt both of them. 
okay. And then yeah, I, you've heard this, the rest of the story uh, <coughs> when I gave the other talk. <coughs> George uh, taught himself to read. Uh, there was a Freedmen's Bureau School opened up eight miles away from his home in Missouri. Uh, when, and so uh, George went to it when he was 10 years old. He finished a high school in his mid-20s and he earned a master's degree in his mid-30s. He did not see the Carvers again until right before um, Moses Carver died. Um, and, and they couldn't correspond with them because the, the, uh, the Carvers were illiterate. Okay, so Moses Carver and Abraham Lincoln were best buddies. Okay, this is the, the new stuff in Pigeon Creek, Indiana, starting in 1816. Uh, Mose was the ninth child of um, in his family, and, it, and more kids came later in, in that family that he came from. They lived in adjoining farms, with the Lincolns and the Carvers. I want to make sure I got that right. Uh, so it was, quote, unquote, Uncle Mose, uh, as George called him, who told him the endless stories about his friend Abraham Lincoln. So that George grew up thinking that Abe was just another uncle of his, almost. So Moses ta taught himself to read, excuse me, ta Moses taught himself to play the fiddle, and then he later taught George how to play the fiddle, too. Both Mose and uh, Abe rejected religion, the religion of their parents. Uh, as you know, that Lincoln's parents were, I think it's, it's described as primitive Southern Baptists, almost like Quakers, as I understand it. Uh, okay, uh, so like Abe, Mose left Pigeon Creek in his 20s and moved to Missouri. Um, and he and his wife, Susan, both illiterate, raised George and Jim Carver, um, until they left home, uh, but they also had three additional kids. Apparently, they, they didn't have any kids of their own. Um, three additional kids of his brother who died early, so they raised five kids. Um, now I only have one thing left to say. Uh, Carver regarded Lincoln as a saint. Uh, Mose had never said anything bad about Abe during this whole process. Uh, and Carver would later keep uh, his distance from W.E. Dubois, uh, who once made a critical uh, remark, maybe more than one critical remark, about Lincoln. My God, I can imagine he knew Dr. Britton, what he might say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so that's the story about uh, the, the linkage about how George Washington Carver came to appreciate uh, Abraham Lincoln. Now this will be con this will cause a lot of controversy among Lincoln scholars on is, on on this whole story. Is it just a story? And I don't I don't know how old uh, <coughs> George Washington Carver was when he started telling these stories. You know, I've had people who it's, it's like a, a, who's who did George Washington sleep in your house that that thing, that then, because people want to grab a hold of a part of history, whether, whether it's legit or not, it's a whole other issue. So uh, that's all I've got to say about it. Uh, Dr. Car Doc Dr. Um, Bella admits that she's not a Lincoln scholar, but she's a really uh, legit, uh, talented historian, and she knew this from this new biography of uh, um, George Washington Carver and she wanted to share this with you today, and you're the first to hear it. But questions about that? <laughs> the, the story is it's really about a, a history thing. Do you believe in oral history? Uh, or you can look at the same thing and have the same event. It's like a draft <coughs> in New York City in, what was that, 1863? Uh, and um, I'm 57% Irish, <coughs> to, to not talk about it, that episode in history, but they occurred, 
and Irish people coming to the United States didn't want to get killed. That wasn't why they came to the United States. You guys can kill each other off in the process. Um, and and it, in this hanging, uh, there's two, view, two ways of viewing that. I see it as uh, the Republicans didn't do well in the off-year election, and we know how our, our beloved Indian uh, <laughs> how, our, how our current governor might choose not to get involved because anybody with any sense who is politically ambitious would have stayed out of what they were doing in Minnesota. As I understand it, it was a, uh, a, uh, a clergyman from Minnesota who sent the letter to Lincoln Whipple. Yeah. And, you know, you got all these headaches on your desk. I was a politician, and if I was a, uh, fighting a civil war that was not going well, you know, I'd say that's a state issue and, and stay away from it. I got enough headaches. But you idealists, here's my idealist way in the back, claim that, you know, pol politics can be uh, done on an idealistic basis. It's no, there's no question that Lincoln hated uh, abolitionists initially. They're very much like Tea Party types. You know, it's a, it's a one issue deal. And Illinois was not a progressive state, it was a racist state. Um, and, and Lincoln grew up in that. So, personally, I think the record shows he was personally always against slavery. Even his parents were, according to the primitive Southern Baptists. But, uh, you know, how do you handle that? issue. Questions, comments? Uh, oh well, I've well, Bill, Native American life, if we have Black Lives Matter as a movement today, clearly Native American lives didn't count very much for any of the politicians. Uh, correct. So in my neighborhood, my all-white neighborhood, growing up in elementary school at Eugene, Oregon, uh, the thing that we did, we played cowboys and Indians. Everybody, all the male kids in the, in the uh, neighborhood played cowboys. No one wanted to play Indians, <laughs> except, <laughs> except for my brother, who was brighter than me, two years older. He read comic books. He's pro Tarzan and uh, <laughs> pro-Indian. I was not bright enough to think about this myself, and so I, I came to adopt his view that he was farther than me. I don't know what that has to do with well, you know, the moral of that story. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, well, we're past time, <coughs> and we'll take a three minute break, and we'll start with the global.